After six grueling months of war, USS Enterprise had proven her steel at the Battle of Midway. The Japanese Navy has taken a beating, but the Big E is about to face her greatest challenge yet, invasion at a place called Guadalcanal. USS Enterprise, a fighting city of steel. She is the most revered and decorated ship of World War II. On this 360 degree battlefield, where threats loom on the seas, in the skies, and in the ocean depths. The Enterprise's enemies could be anywhere and everywhere. There's nowhere to run when the battle's all around you. Battle 360, USS Enterprise, Jaws of the Enemy. August 7th, 1942, 6.13 a.m. Off a remote Pacific island, the stillness of the waters is shattered by massive artillery blasts. The cruiser USS Quincy has opened fire with her eight-inch guns. The island is about to become famous. Its name? Guadalcanal. Other cruisers and destroyers quickly join in, drowning Japanese shore positions in a tsunami of lead and steel. It was exhilarating <laughs> to see all the big shells going to shore and to hear the, the shells exploding. Dive bombers from Enterprise unleash thousand pound bombs on the island. Their success is marked by the massive fireballs from exploding shore installations and fuel dumps, which can be seen miles away by the men aboard the ships of the task force. Minutes later, landing craft head for the beaches and U.S. Marines storm ashore. It is the Marines' first experience of invasion in the Pacific War. I know from personal experience exactly what they're feeling right now by going right into the Jaws enemy. There's a lot of anxiety they're feeling, a lot of confusion, but overall, they're focusing on their task at hand. For the first time in World War II, the American military is on the full offensive. Everything else up to that point was strictly defensive, even the Battle of Midway. But the Solomons was the first offensive action. As the invaders hit the beach, the men aboard Enterprise wait offshore, unaware of the day's strategic significance. Pedro Sandoval has only been on the Big E a few weeks, but the confidence of Enterprise's veteran sailors has already rubbed off on this teenager from Laredo, Texas. Who is headed for danger? And you know you're headed for danger, there's nothing you can do about it. Just relax and do the best you can. And that's what we did. But to the architects of the war, this invasion is the key to the future. The Solomon Islands lie in the center of shipping lanes in the Pacific, just 1,200 miles off the coast of Australia. Whoever controls the Solomons controls the war. And the Japanese Navy has made the island of Guadalcanal the center square in the chessboard of the Pacific. The Japanese were obviously extremely disheartened by their defeat at Midway, but they did not believe that that meant that they had lost the war overnight. Throughout the summer of 1942, the Japanese have invaded the Solomon Islands and are building an airfield on Guadalcanal. If they succeed, they'll be within easy striking distance of the vital sea lanes of the South Pacific. And that's only the beginning. From this base that they're building on Guadalcanal, they will be able to launch multi-engine medium bombers. This will be done as a precursor to the invasion of Australia. An 
an air base on Guadalcanal could potentially mean the loss of Australia to the Japanese. Enterprise must put a stop to this plan. Target, Guadalcanal. Objective, seize the island and its airfield from the Japanese. Strategy, send a combined fleet of cruisers, battleships and carriers to bombard Guadalcanal and deliver one division of Marines to assault the island. Then begin the long march toward Tokyo. For the first time in World War II, a new weapon joins Enterprise's protective arsenal, the battleship. USS North Carolina is an offensive and defensive powerhouse, combining anti-aircraft defense with massive shore bombardment capabilities. She has nine 16-inch guns and 25-inch 38s, backed up with a score of automatic anti-aircraft guns. With a cruising speed of nearly 30 knots, she's perfect protection for the Big Eagle. Fire Controlman Harold Smith and his shipmates aboard North Carolina are looking for action. Oh, we were very eager. I mean, we were a cocky ship. We were a good ship. We were well trained. The whole crew was very cocky. We couldn't wait to get going. The fleet makes its way to the Solomons. At dawn, August 7th, 1942, the savage battle begins. Enterprise launches its air groups and bombards Guadalcanal. They first disable the enemy airstrip. Surface ships bombard the shore. Then, the Marines hit the beach. And the long battle for Guadalcanal was underway. As Marine riflemen put boots on the ground, 15,000 feet above, the skies roar with dozens of warplanes. 18 Enterprise dive bombers pummel the island with a barrage of 1,000-pound bombs. As Wildcat fighter planes strafe the enemy positions, Manned only by work crews and a handful of soldiers, the Japanese base is not prepared for an invasion. There is no resistance. It came as a real surprise to them that all of a sudden one of their outposts had been attacked. Initially, they badly underestimated the size of forces that we had present on the island. But the walk in the park soon ends. At 12.30, the Japanese strike back. Enemy fighters appear over the southern tip of Guadalcanal. They are led by Saburo Sakai, the Red Baron of the Japanese Air Corps, with over 50 kills to his credit. He's gunning to add some of the Big E's warplanes to his grim tally. One of the first men to meet the enemy head on is Wildcat pilot Vincent Dupois, a 1939 Annapolis graduate who has been aboard Enterprise as a member of Fighting Squadron 6 since mid-June. Enterprise was known to be the crack ship of the U.S. Navy, so I was really quite blown up over the prospect of being a member of Fighting 6 aboard Enterprise. Dupois and his pack of Wildcats are flying protection over the island battleground. Suddenly, 12 miles ahead, Dupois spots a formation of twin-engine bombers and fighter planes. As I approached, I could see fighters that appeared to be diving on the large group of bombers headed north. And I mistook these small aircraft for fighters from Fighting Five from the Saratoga that I figured were out there working the bombers over. It turned out I was wrong. These were not friendly fighters. These were the escorting Japanese Zeros. Dupois ignores the fighters and heads for the incoming bombers. The flyers of Fighting Six go on the attack. 
ripping up Japanese bombers with savage bursts of 50 caliber machine gun fire. Dubois fires on a bedding and watches it spin toward the sea in smoke and flames. Only then does he realize he's in trouble. I heard this ticking sound, and then I realized that I was being fired at, and bullets were entering the cockpit and hitting my instrument panel. From only 200 feet behind Dupois, Saburo Sakai peppers the American plane with hot lead. Fighting ace closes in for the kill. Dubois takes a bullet in his shoulder, but he's still able to make a tight S turn and disappear into a billowing cumulus cloud, losing Sakai. The Japanese ace zeroes in on his next victim. Radio man gunner Edward Anderson is heading back to the ship in his SBD Dauntless when he sees Sakai's plane approaching in the distance. He came up underneath the plane I was in and fired and shattered the radio transmitter in my cockpit, which is right practically between my legs. Sakai comes in from behind for the kill. It's a mistake he will quickly regret. Sakai mistakenly believes he's attacking a Wildcat, which has no rear seat gunner, rather than a dive bomber, which very much does. Machine gun fire tears Sakai's canopy apart. He came practically straight back of us, and then he made a big wing over, and we could see smoke trailing from his ship, and he just faded into the horizon, going back, smoking all the way, and we all thought he was going to crash. Although one bullet has blasted Sakai in the face and blinded him in one eye, he somehow manages to pull his Zero out of a deadly dive and make it back to base. I think it's just a testament to the training, skill, and really the fitness levels of pilots but to be able to pilot that aircraft 500 miles when you're hanging on to a thin thread of life and bleeding profusely in the face, it's, uh, it's pretty impressive. Sakai will be out of action for five months. By the time night falls over Guadalcanal, the Americans have managed to destroy 36 enemy aircraft. By the next morning, the Marines have captured the Japanese airfield and renamed it Henderson Field after Major Lofton Henderson, a Marine dive bomber pilot killed at Midway. The American ground commander, General Vandegrift, uh, very wisely decides to establish a perimeter all the way around the airfield and defend it in depth, um, perceiving almost at once that Henderson Field really is the key to this entire affair. The initial invasion of Guadalcanal is a resounding success. If the rest of the fight for the island is this simple, it will be a short war. The confident Navy brass sends Enterprise and her sister carrier Wasp out to sea and away from the action, leaving only a token fleet to support the mopping up operations. But the victory celebration is premature and the decision to send Enterprise to sea is fateful. If you underestimate your enemy, you yourself will not be as combat effective and as prepared. Because if you go in there with an attitude that they're not that good, you're gonna end up with your kicked. As the Americans celebrate their successful landing, two Japanese surface task forces steam toward the island. The U.S. Navy is about to be reminded that the night belongs to the Japanese. Their night optics are much better than ours. 
They have very highly trained lookouts who are capable of detecting an enemy warship at long distances, in some cases even farther away than American warships equipped with radar were able to detect. August 8, 1942. One day after the successful invasion, the enemy ships steamed down the New Georgia Sound, headed directly for the American fleet anchored off Guadalcanal, near the volcanic peak called Savo Island. The heavy cruiser USS Vincennes is one of the ships supporting the Guadalcanal invasion. Ships like Vincennes are the vital heavy frigates of the Pacific Fleet. Born in the Four River Plant in Quincy, Massachusetts, 588-foot Vincennes is a veteran of the Doolittle Raid and the Battle of Midway. She's one of seven New Orleans-class heavy cruisers with an armament of eight and five-inch cannons backed up by 50 caliber machine guns. In the dead of night, the Japanese task force slinks in closer, slipping around the allied net of destroyers and cruisers. Enterprise, the carrier, is not anywhere near Savo Island or the waters off Guadalcanal uh, when this happens. And it's probably beneficial if she isn't. The men aboard USS Vincennes awake to gunfire and explosions. Flares and star shells erupt on the southern horizon. Vincennes scrambles to general quarters as a massive battle explodes all around them. Seconds later, blinding light floods the entire ship. Searchlight beams have just discovered the American frigate. They're dead in the crosshairs of the Imperial fleet. A lethal enemy broadside brackets the Vincennes. Her crew opens fire with their main battery turrets to try and shoot out the searchlight. But it's too late. An onslaught of Japanese shells hail down on the cruiser. And two long lance torpedoes tear into her number one fire room. Within minutes, Vincennes is dead in the water. It's not the only one. Japanese torpedoes and shells land a deadly one-two punch on heavy cruisers Chicago and Canberra. Astoria and Quincy are hit at the same time as Vincennes. The Allied Navy never saw it coming. The Japanese Navy had a very well thought out set of night fighting tactics that they used, meaning that even in conditions of surprise and confusion, which are endemic to night fighting in general, they were often able to react appropriately and more quickly than their American counterparts. Probably even more successful than the Japanese element of surprise was the psychological effect on the American Navy. There was a sense that we had technological superiority, better equipment, we had a better navy, and yet the Japanese used one of their best tactics, shattering that concept. In just 32 minutes, the enemy sinks four heavy cruisers and badly damages a cruiser and a destroyer. What remains of the American fleet escapes out to sea. So many sunken ships are left behind that the sea lane is nicknamed Iron Bottom Sound. Over a thousand U.S. sailors are killed in the night battle of Savo Island. It's a steep price to pay for underestimating the enemy. The Americans have been successful then in putting ground forces on Guadalcanal, but because of the Battle of Savo Island, uh, the Americans ended up having to pull their supply ships out of those waters very expeditiously. From the shores of Guadalcanal, Marines had seen the battle and thought it was the Japanese fleet that was taking the pounding. When they wake up the next morning, it's a slightly different situation. In the next few hours, there's not really going to be an American task force at Guadalcanal. 
they leave. The ones that haven't been sunk pull out. The transports, they offload some of their equipment and supplies, and then they pull out. Abandoned and alone, the grunts on the ground are left to defend Guadalcanal with little more than light artillery and World War I-era Springfield rifles. So almost from the get-go, the Americans are in a precarious position in terms of their logistics, and that would define the fighting for the Americans throughout uh, the next two or three months, trying to build up enough materiel uh, to keep that base in operation and you know, finally secure the island. The invasion is an unqualified success one day and a complete disaster the next. With the American fleet sunk off Savo, the Marines' only hope of holding on is protection from carriers like Enterprise. And the enemy knows it. From their bases in Rabaul and Truk, the Japanese send a massive carrier task force and troop transports to Guadalcanal. Their plan, destroy Enterprise and the other American carriers and wipe out the Marines on the island. August 20th, 1942. Three Japanese carriers steam toward the Solomons. Two of them, Shokaku and Zuikaku, are the largest carriers in the Japanese Navy, veterans of Pearl Harbor. The third, a lighter carrier named Ryujo, escorts Japanese troop transports heading for Guadalcanal. Twelve hundred miles away, the Navy brass are seemingly unaware of their precarious position. There's no sign of Japanese reinforcements, so the carrier Wasp is sent south to refuel. One third of the task force disappears over the horizon, leaving Enterprise and her sister carrier Saratoga alone to face the oncoming Japanese menace. For the sailors of Enterprise, it's business as usual. Merle Twibel is a 26-year-old from Kansas, stationed in Enterprise's machine shop. Situated below decks, it is repair central for every piece of equipment aboard ship. All the elevators and the ammunition hoists, everything hydraulic, we were responsible for that. Twibel's a tinkerer. Among his achievements, He's modified the standard issue breathing apparatus used by the ship's fire rescue crews, doubling its capacity. One man's small contribution to the war effort on this floating fortress. All around the ship, the men of Enterprise are getting nervous. It's been too long since the last action. Alfred Ace McCollum and his twin brother Alphys have a sense of foreboding. We knew we was going to battle. And he, uh, I guess, pre-nation, he said, today I die. I said, so do I. Just like that, joking, you know. We knew the Jap carriers were in the area. We'd had some surface battles at night that we'd heard about, and uh, we just waited for it to happen. And of course, it happened on August 24th. That was the day we got our baptism of fire. August 24th, 1942. As day breaks, Enterprise scout patrols take off in search of the Japanese task force. On board ship, the normal routine continues. Nothing much was happening, so I went down to the supply office to play a continuation of a checker tournament with my friend Paul Miller. He's a pretty good guy. He was a storekeeper from Omaha, Nebraska. And his widowed mother was at home there and earnestly praying for him, I'm sure. 9.35 a.m., Enterprise scouts have found nothing, but an American PBY spots a tempting target. It is the light carrier Ryujo, protected only by the heavy cruiser Tone. The PBY radios back and Enterprise bombers prepare for action.
Around 11 o'clock, the general quarters alarm rang. We put the checkerboard back, said we'll finish the game later, and Paul went down about four or five decks below the water line, and I went up to where the captain's bridge was. At 12.39 p.m., 23 dive bombers take off to hit Ryujo. We knew that the Japs were there, our patrol planes, the PBYs had spotted them. And our planes were sent out to find them. Ed Anderson is aboard a Dauntless as it first makes contact. As we got to the end of our segment of the search, we did see two heavy cruisers and a whole bunch of destroyers. So my pilot got some altitude, and we made a run on one of the cruisers and dropped his bomb up alongside the rear end of the ship. They were shooting at us, and we were shooting at them. But we got through, I don't know how. The bombers of Enterprise work over the Japanese carrier. soon turning her into a floating wreck. The victory is short-lived. 100 miles behind Ryujo and her escorts, the giant Japanese carriers Shokaku and Zuikaku are ready to pounce. Ryujo is bait for a trap, and Enterprise has sailed right into it. Shokaku and Zuikaku are sister ships. Both carriers helped launch the Pearl Harbor attacks, and both are destined to meet Enterprise again and again on the field of battle. Over 800 feet long, with crews of at least 1,600 men, these twin sisters can launch more than 160 aircraft against Enterprise. Waves of bombers launch within striking distance of the Big E. 4 p.m. Enterprise, Saratoga, and their escorts sail in close circles, expecting only a minor scrap. American radar isn't picking up any aircraft, but it should be. 88 miles away, a massive air assault closes in. There was a horrible breakdown in terms of the radar functionality on board both of the American carriers. Normally, we have been getting detection ranges of up around 75 to 85 miles, and in this case, didn't detect the incoming Japanese aircraft until they were almost on top of the Americans. My good friend Charlie Mason and I were on the flight deck. We watched the ship's radar point in a certain direction and stop revolving, just hunt back and forth. So we knew that they've seen us and they were on the way. Every gun on Enterprise is trained on the sky. Every man at his battle station. In the skies overhead, 54 Wildcat fighters patrol around the carriers like a protective swarm of hornets. The enemy is out there somewhere and gaining fast. 4.19 p.m., the Wildcats encounter the first Japanese planes. Two formations of bombers escorted by Zeros. The fight is on. For 20 minutes, the skies are filled with machine gun fire as the air forces grapple in an aerial deathmatch. American fighter pilots down an astounding 29 Japanese planes. Meanwhile, the rest of the Enterprise air groups scramble to get into the skies. 17,000 feet in the air, Enterprise pilot Vincent Dubois spots a low incoming zero. He had an advantage of probably three or 4,000 feet when I first saw him. When I got to within about 1,000 or 1,500 feet, he pushed over and went by me like a bat out of hell. I didn't get a shot as he went by. 
Dupois pushes into a dive and chases the enemy aircraft. Suddenly, the air is blanketed with exploding flak and tracers from his own ships. I looked down, and here was his battleship below me, and of course, they were doing their best to knock him down, and probably me. They were shooting at him, and I was getting the benefit of it. Amazingly, the enemy flyer dodges the rapid gunfire from North Carolina and makes his escape. As the last American planes lift off from the deck of Enterprise and head for the enemy carriers, the gunners aboard ship wait for their first clear shot. It's only a matter of time before the Japanese planes get clear of the fighters and make their plunge on the Big E. One of the ship's key defenses, the 20-millimeter battery. The Orlikon 20-millimeter is a 70-caliber air-cooled anti-aircraft machine gun. The weapon has an effective range of 1,000 yards and can spit out a stream of fire at 450 rounds per minute. Manning the port side 20-millimeter gallery are Marines Joe Shinka and Frank Graves. Platoon Sergeant Joe Shinka was a character aboard ship, uh, always giving us young sergeants a bad time. Uh, Joe always chomping a cigar when he could get them. But on the 24th of August, Joe spotted dive bombers. Shinka spots sunlight gleaming off the wings of an enemy vow. He doesn't wait for orders. He opens fire. The rest of the ship's guns blaze, just as 30 dive bombers plunge out of the skies. On the flight deck, Roy Blood and his friend, Charlie Mason, stare in disbelief. We watched this first dive bomber coming straight down. And when we saw this little black object drop away from the plane, we knew it was a bomb. I said, Charlie, let's get the hell out of here. And boom, that's when it started. The first bomb is a near miss. Enterprise erupts with gunfire as every battery spews lead. Directly behind Enterprise waits 45,000 ton battleship North Carolina, ready to blast the enemy to hell. We knew it was a fairly good strike. Enterprise was their target. They were paying more attention to the Enterprise than the rest of us. Battleship North Carolina explodes with anti-aircraft fire. The earth-shattering eruption takes the entire fleet by surprise. And the Enterprise asked us if we were on fire because we were firing so many guns at the planes. Back on Enterprise, her five-inch gun crews hammer out a barrage at the incoming planes. Enterprise's first defensive weapon her eight, five-inch, 38-caliber dual-purpose guns are the best in World War II. With a team of the Big E's gunners behind them, they can lob 15 five-inch explosive shells per minute at a maximum range of 18,200 yards. But firepower comes at a cost. There is almost no protection for the gunners who stand out in the open. A steel helmet is all that stands between them and a gruesome death. The ship is shaking and roaring with noise, vibration. That's when the fear comes. It's not the fear so much of dying, it's the fear that god-awful noise must mean something is coming at us. As unrelenting gunfire rattles the Enterprise, the ship takes evasive action, bobbing and weaving like a prize fighter on the choppy seas. Basically, there's no place to go. The dive bombers are aiming right for the middle of that flight deck. Gunners keep a steady stream of fire, within minutes downing 15 enemy planes. Despite several close calls, Enterprise remains unscathed. 
but the Japanese dive bombers are moving too fast for effective anti-aircraft fire. And we had anti-aircraft guns galore, including those of the battleship North Carolina, who was sailing right alongside us. They did the best they could, but somehow or another, one or two or three or four of those planes slipped through. For the first time, Lucky Enterprise runs out of luck. 4.44 p.m. A VAL dive bomber scores a direct hit on Enterprise. The 550-pound bomb plows through five decks, then explodes with a numbing force that rattles the ship and wreaks havoc in her bowels. The first bomb hit right back at the fantail and went down to the keel of the ship where my friend Paul Miller was located and his crew of 22 damage control repair people was wiped out immediately. Pedro Sandoval and his damage control crew wait in Enterprise's sick bay, where the explosion catches them completely by surprise. And we got hit by the bombs, and that ship felt like a Model T going in a rough road. I told the guys, let's get out of here because the sick bay was full of smoke. Sandoval leads his comrades to safety, then makes his way to his battle station on the hangar deck. I got up in the hangar deck and went to my shop, and right beside me is a kid there laying down calling for his mother. He might have been 18 years old. He wanted water. I went to give him water, and the, the government said no. He said, you don't have him. The back of his head's gone. James Barnhill is two levels above the flight deck when the bomb hits. His younger brother, also serving aboard Enterprise, is directing anti-aircraft fire from Sky Control. I glanced back up at Sky Control where I could ordinarily see him, and I didn't see him anywhere, and it looked like Sky Control was crumpled way over to the side, and uh, I started crying. Fortunately, Barnhill is mistaken. Sky Control has been strafed, but it still stands with no casualties. Barnhill's mistake is just a case of combat nerves. The bomb had hit just below us and blew all those guys' parts on up there with us. And yeah, I guess I was in shock. sound of explosion seemed to go on forever. This is the first direct hit the Big E has ever suffered. Reeling in shock, groping blindly about in the clouds of thick smoke, the surviving sailors desperately fight to save the ship. The Big E is hit and listed just as another squadron of dive bombers begin their assault. August 24th, 1942, near the island of Guadalcanal, USS Enterprise is assaulted by combined aerial attacks. At 4.44 p.m., a dive bomber makes a direct hit on the Big E's deck. Terrible catch for this down there with the repair crews. They would be locked into their particular area and with all the hatches locked down and everything, and they just sit there and wait. The devastation is just beginning. 30 seconds later, a VAL scores another direct hit, 15 feet from the first one. 
The explosion detonates the powder bags and the five-inch gun tubs, and a massive ball of fire plumes over the ship. There were two five-inch gun crews there. Both crews were just wiped out instantly. And there were shoes that had been on the feet of those people that had been blown out of those positions there by the concussion of that blast. 38 men are instantly burned alive. They were at their duty loading ammunition into the five inch guns. Some of the people were frozen in that position as they found them. Some getting ready to hand shells to someone else. The gun captain in his little cradle pointing the gun. It was a very eerie sight. Among the dead is Ace McCullum's twin brother, who had predicted his own death that morning. When they hit Baker, then I knew he went. Ten men are so horribly burned that they are never identified. There was a guy sitting on the gun mount without any clothes on, burned right off, and he was cooked and burned open. His body had burst open in riblets, like a cooked hot dog, and just his web belt was still around his waist. His head was gone. There was just clumps of body laying on the gun mount platform. For months after that, you couldn't eat because the smell of the flesh was in there all the time. As Enterprise trails smoke and flame, her damaged control crews leap into action through the now listing carrier to control the fires. During all of this, every gun on deck continues to spew out flak. One thousand yards away, USS North Carolina blasts planes out of the sky with a deadly barrage. We have ten five-inch guns going off at the same time. We were firing so fast that they burned the paint off the barrels. Can't remember how many rounds we fired, but it was a lot. 400, 500 rounds we fired in that seven minutes. But two minutes after the second bomb hits, another enemy dives. I'd been standing out on the port wing of the bridge, and I saw this plane coming down from out of nowhere. And it dropped what looked like a pea. And pretty soon it became a baseball. And then it was a grapefruit. And by the time it got to be a watermelon, I said, time for me to head inside. And I got behind the armor plating of the pilot house. And about that time, whoom! A third bomb, 500 pounds of enemy hell, nails Enterprise just forward of the number two elevator. The blast punches a 10-foot hole in the flight deck and knocks out the elevator platform. It went down into the hangar next space and exploded in pieces. But the worst damage was back aft, where it set the ship on fire, broke down the steering mechanism. Up on the bridge, Captain Arthur Davis orders a full left rudder, but the helmsman cannot get the rudder to answer. The bomb has hit the steering mechanism. Enterprise is careening out of control. Now, the entire task force must turn in circles around Enterprise to keep from ramming into her. We were going round and round in circles. The flight deck was at quite an angle, and we were losing airplanes over the side. They would just fall off the side. To lose the helm in the middle of a battle, that's the worst thing that the captain of a ship could ever live to see. Enterprise turns in hopeless circles and nearly collides with a destroyer. We couldn't steer out of the way of other ships. We were panicked. We had fires, we were damaged below decks. 
we were circling in a very tight circle. And blowing the emergency whistle to keep the other ships out of our way, to keep from colliding with them. And we circled the hull for quite some time. USS Enterprise is aflame and out of the fight. Their mission accomplished. The last of the Japanese bombers break off their attack and disappear into the clouds. Desperately, the crews below deck struggle to fight the fires and get control of the ship. We got orders from main control to go back and try to find out what happened in the steering gear. Flames and smoke fill the passages, but chief machinist mate, William Smith, has a secret weapon, the homemade breathing device created by machinist Merle Twible. I gave it to him and he said, I'm going down the steering gear, and he took off and went. Those fires were raging down and around the engine room quarters and the temperature gauges registered up to 180 degrees and those gauges had gone as high as they could go. I've been told that at 145 degrees, the sweat will all disappear from your body. You start having chills, and the linings of your lungs will become charred and seared. Forty minutes elapse as Smith and the repair teams fight their way to the steering room. Sure, it was hot down there, and there was smoke, but he saw that hydraulic big valve was in the neutral position. Smith pushes the valve into gear, and the rudder is now under control. It is Twible's rescue breathing apparatus, or RBA, that literally saves the Enterprise. If he hadn't have had this RBA with this stuff on it, he wouldn't have been able to get down there as quick as he did. How these guys survived, I will never know. I think they're the true heroes of that day there because they got the ship righted, they got the rudder straightened out, they got the gears greased, and they got the ship back on course. When the USS Enterprise leaves the field of battle at Eastern Solomons, she's hurt. She's hurt bad. The ship's deck is torn and smoldering. The number two and three airplane elevators are disabled. Jagged gashes, Gigantic holes riddle the hull, and seawater is still flooding into the ship's bowels. And with a malfunctioning radar, the men of Enterprise don't realize that a second wave of aerial assaults has been launched from the gigantic Japanese carriers. In a twist of fate, the Big E's damage actually saves her. The bombers are unable to find Enterprise because she is no longer on course. Later, the radar picked up a large flight of Japanese planes the southwest of us, where we would have been had we maintained that course. So we think that going in a circle for an hour or two uh, saved us from being hit. The next day, the wounded giant steams into friendly waters and the Enterprise's deck becomes the scene of an emotional farewell to the ship's fallen men. That was a very solemn affair. I can still remember that bugle with its mournful rendition of taps. We had two or three boys in caskets, flag draped. We'd line up in the tension and say a few words to chaplain and uh, slide them over the side. That was in respect for the dead. Those that we were had to recover, we put them in a mattress cover with a 53-pound projectile and eased them over the stern while this was going on. Terrible job. I had bad dreams about it for years. Sorry about that. 
except for the fact that the young Captain Randall moved us to the 20 millimeters, my group of people would have been, uh, someone would have been putting us in a mattress cover and putting us over the fantail also. You were not an 18 year old boy no more. You was a man. Made you in a hurry. You grew up fast. You grew up fast. 77 men are dead, 91 are wounded, and the Enterprise is no longer invincible. For the first time, this ship is hit by bombs, and it's instantly realized how vulnerable a carrier is under air attack, and how vulnerable men are serving a carrier in an air attack. The battle has devastated Enterprise. But it is a victory for America. The Big E has held off another assault on Guadalcanal. As the great battered carrier sails to the American base at Noumea, New Caledonia for repairs, Japan looks at the scorecard and sees disaster. Enterprise has been hit. But she hit back hard. Enterprise bombers have sunk the carrier Ryujo. 70 planes and their crews are victims of Enterprise's deadly firepower. The giant Japanese carriers Shukaku and Zuikaku are in full retreat. The Big E has stopped Japan's thrust toward Australia, dead in its tracks. The Japanese plan was to reinforce the garrison on the island of Guadalcanal. And because an American aircraft carrier task force sailed out, met them, engaged them, and fought them in a spirited battle, they didn't make it through. Guadalcanal remains in American hands. The Battle of the Eastern Solomons is a tactical and strategic U.S. victory. For Harold Smith and his buddies on battleship North Carolina, their violent initiation on August 24, 1942, will never be forgotten. We went back to Pearl and went out to the tattoo shops. We put them on our left wrist. Though faded by time and age, the date still remains on the sailor's skin, an eternal reminder. And we were going to make a pledge that we'd have a reunion every year on August 24th. Make that as our initiation. I can relate to why those sailors went and got their tattoos. Of course I can. It was a big day in their life. And I'm sure every day he looks at that, he thanks God that he's alive. Enterprise has endured her hellish baptism of fire, but at a price. She returns to Pearl Harbor for repairs, and the enemy will seize this opportunity. The Japanese Navy intends another assault on the blood-soaked island called Guadalcanal. Hundreds of Japanese ships will begin steaming down through the island chain, bringing massive reinforcements. When Enterprise returns to battle, she will find herself facing an Imperial fleet that outnumbers the Americans by two to one. And aircraft carriers are their number one target. Bloodied but unbeaten, Enterprise is about to steam toward another fight. <laughs>